We are speaking into Psalm 23. I'll read it to you in the, uh, in the version that I'm enjoying at the moment. The New Living Translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green pastures. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close behind me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies, or a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings, and our verse for today, surely goodness and mercy, or your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of of the Lord forever. This is God's word. As I get going, I wonder if um, the Welcome Home team can get my um, whiteboard up next to me here in the shot for the camera, if you guys could do that while I talk. We live in a, a merciless society, and the more we allow ourselves to be afraid, the less we're capable of giving and receiving mercy and goodness. Have you noticed that it is more and more difficult at this time to actually receive and give mercy? I think our, our city and our region was pretty low on mercy to start with, but given the, the sort of trauma and stress of the pandemic and uh, the economic crunch, people are getting lower and lower on mercy with every passing day. Would you agree? We, we, we are merciless. We take advantage of every opportunity. Uh, the simplest way, if you don't believe me, is if you watch what happens in the traffic. It's very hard to get somebody to let you in. And so you have to shove in. And because you have to shove in, someone gets angry with you and you get angry with them and then you lack mercy to someone else. We can't even let each other in in the traffic. How are we gonna, how are we gonna build gracious hospitals? How are we gonna have a gentle education system that's fair and just? How are we going to help people with our crisis with higher education? We can't even manage our anger in the traffic. <laughs> We're so selfish. We're so merciless. And I was chatting to some people in our connect group. You know, this is the story uh, that I speak to you about so many people in the working world. It, it's almost got a script. A person who loves God and is trying to work really hard and actually cares about more than their paycheck is applying themselves in a team. Here's a real story. A person works in a team of eight, and everybody else just sits around all day, and he's had conflict. He's asked managers to get involved, but the company doesn't take any responsibility. They just don't pay attention. His, his, his line management doesn't pay any attention. And so a team of eight, he does all of the work for eight people because he's so tired of having conflict with people who are happy to take a paycheck and sit and do nothing with no care for the fact that the company may be going backwards and they may not have an income at the end of that month or at the end of the year. And Christians get so tired of doing conflict that they'd rather burn themselves out doing good and taking on everyone else's responsibility. And we're, we're chatting and we're saying, you know, you've got you've to fight against that. There's, there's a grabbiness, there's a greed that's taken hold of us. There's a, there's a way in which we are willing at every opportunity to take advantage in the workplace. You can't leave stuff on your desk because it goes. You can't leave your profile open because you know someone will take a shortcut. You, you can't trust people in the workplace because they are going to cut you off. They'll throw you under the bus when it's not your fault. Another real conversation, someone working in the Department of Education uh, prepping policy and reports for about eight different sites in the Eastern Cape, 
and then Parliament is coming, and so management is totally behind, and, Par and Parliament says we demand a report. Now, the person who's meant to produce the report is a junior officer, and they have senior management. And they don't put the senior management, the senior management doesn't stand there and say, guys, we are six months behind. We're really sorry. We take responsibility for this. Let it fall on us. They push the junior consultant out in front, and they say, you take the hit for the team because I've got a career here that I'm trying to build. Merciless, greedy, abusive. We take anything free. I was in the, 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 the queue at Clicks the other day, and they, they just decided, uh, I don't know why, they were just feeling generous. They're going to give these free sanitizers. It's like, a, it's like an aloe vera gel with a little bit of perfume. You know, it might be sold for like 10 rand, and they're free. And so, you know, there's, there's, there, it catches on in the queue. Hey, these things are free. Did you know? And people are telling each other. Hey, you don't see people going and getting one. You see people like... <laughs> you can't trust us at buffets because we pile that plate so high. We're going to get every... If it's 150 rand, we're going to take 290 rands worth. Yeah, because people... Pe and, and, any, and, and this is just a symptom of what's happening on the inside of us. You know, it, and it's so difficult. This is the, the theme for today. Um, it's so difficult for us to believe, just put my theme slide up, that goodness and mercy are still present in our world. Goodness and mercy, just put it up for us, please, will follow us all the days of our lives. Surely, David says, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We, we, we have so much fear and anxiety. This is my, my first point here. When fear and anxiety take over our lives, they stop us from having any capacity to experience goodness and to usher in mercy in our world. Because we believe that we live in a world that is merciless and has no capacity for goodness, we ourselves can become afraid, and then we are merciless and lack goodness in our relationships with other people. I was chatting to, I chat to all my Bolt drivers. Um, Vicky and I share a car, so I take Bolt a lot. And they're talking about how uh, the taxi industry, especially the Pelés, are physically attacking, harassing Bolt drivers because they say you're taking part of our economic share when it actually exists in a different place in the economy. Uh, you can't even trust, a, we were talking about this yesterday at the men's breakfast, you can't even trust the public transport system to get you to work on time. It runs late. So you're late at work. You're getting letters of warning at work. Now you want to take a bolt so that it actually gets you to work on time. But now the bolt driver can't work because he's being shut down by the people who are, who are producing a lousy service in a dirty, unsafe car. And goodness cannot advance in our society because we are grabbing. We are desperate. We are every 10 rand, every 6 rand, every 3 rand. There's not enough for us. And into this context, God wants to speak a word of healing to our souls, a word of healing to our broken society. It says, children, my dear children, whether you know Jesus or not, you do not live in a world that is in lack, where you have to grab and fight and claw and take advantage of one another. You live in a world that is made by me. It is a world of abundance. And as a heavenly father, I want to pour out my blessing on creation. There is more than enough for you. Stop biting and grabbing one another. Your goodness and mercy can follow you all the days of your life. You don't need to grab. You don't need to fight. You don't need to compete. You don't need to manipulate. You don't need to lie. You don't need to steal. You don't need to cut corners. You you can simply trust in my blessing. You can trust in my covenant promise. And it's open to everyone. And I want this family to get bigger. I want more people. I want an overflowing blessing. This is David's cry. And he is not confident about it as he's saying it. Because he lives in a world just like you and me. He doesn't say goodness and mercy are with me. He's praying. He's going... I see the, the, the brokenness of my world, but surely when I see my shepherd, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I just, 
I want to just share one more story to underline this emotionally for you. This is really fresh. Last night, uh, I live in a complex, and um, there's a WhatsApp group that attends to various issues in the complex. And last night, they post a video um, of a threat, and they say, here's a reminder that you must always close the gate. So now we're all wondering what this threat is, and you push play on the CCTV camera video, and there's an old man. His shoes are broken, and the labels have fallen out the front, and it's raining, and it's cold, and he goes in the gate like this. He's got a limp. They took that man and they arrested him and they dragged him to the police station and they posted on the group, we've neutralized this threat in our community. How dare you? How dare you? Someone who needed a warm cup of soup and some clean clothes and a conversation is now posted with his picture, shamed by a wealthy community as the face of fear and threat. We have become so cruel, God have mercy on us. We have become so cruel. We have become so lost in our sense of lack that we will abuse people, we will abuse the poor, and only the mercy and love of God can heal us of this need to abuse people. We do not have mercy and love are supernatural things. This is what the pandemic has taught us. Everybody thought that life actually made sense, that we could trust in politics, that we could trust in economic systems, that we could trust in education, that we could trust in policy, that we could trust in all the sophisticated structures and analysis that we are doing in our world. And the pandemic saw it all fall flat and it brought out the worst of human nature in people who are lost, and it brought out the best of human nature in people who are connected to the kingdom of God. And as I said already, it just showed that the darkness is getting darker and the light is getting brighter. And we are supposed to be learning that our world is empty and hopeless to have mercy or goodness without the presence of Jesus Christ. And God is not interested in solving, he's not interested in fixing the world right now. I'm not praying Friends, that God would make it all go away, that we'd feel better. I'm praying, Lord, let it get as dark as it needs to get until we see that our only hope is in you, Jesus. Amen. That our only hope is in the kingdom of God. That, that without the kingdom of God, we have no saving story. Politics cannot save us. Policy cannot save us. Education cannot save us. Money cannot save us. Only Jesus and his kingdom can bring healing to the earth, can restore a way of life that is in order. And Jesus, I just want to say this to somebody who's disappointed with life right now. Jesus is not interested in making you happy. <laughs> Can I say this to you as gently as I possibly can? Jesus is not interested in making you happy. He is not interested actually primarily in solving your problems. He is interested, his primary agenda is in making you holy and preparing you to be part of a new humanity that will be ready and fit to occupy the new Jerusalem. He is interested in making you part of a kingdom that will last forever. He is interested in forming the character of Christ in you, goodness and mercy and joy in the presence of difficult circumstances and hope in the presence of pain and generosity in the presence of lack and forgiveness in the presence of attack and, and courage in the presence of fear. He wants to build that in you so that we will show that without Jesus there is no hope in our world and that this kingdom will advance and get bigger and bigger and bigger and one day when Jesus comes back, this kingdom will come as a city out of heaven, a brand new way of life, and it will redeem and bring healing to the earth. He wants to prepare you for citizenship in that city. He doesn't want to make your life better in this one. He wants to prepare your life for citizen in that city, citizenship in that city. And, and so this eternal perspective, it's supposed to help us. It's not an abdication of our responsibility here. 
it's saying that we are supposed to be learning how things really are. So I wanted to just show you this, that this is your human life, and this is all of humanity. And God's goodness, God's goodness and his mercy, God's goodness and his mercy, they have ultimately been shown to us by Jesus dying for us on the cross. You may be praying all kinds of prayers. God, fix this in my life. God, do this in my community. Jesus, please, in my neighborhood. Jesus, in my body, in, in, my, in my family. And actually, he's given you a sure and certain sign. And this ought to be enough for us. This, this is what we look to so that we understand and recognize God's mercy. And then we have other people here. And we expect other people to show us mercy and goodness so that we believe in the goodness of God. We expect the world to have goodness and mercy in it so that we believe in the goodness of God. And when we expect it to be this direction, we are looking in the wrong direction. We need to look to the goodness and mercy of God. We need to receive the goodness and mercy of God into our lives, and that is the place from which we have the power to treat other people with mercy and to bring about goodness in our world. This is our source. The cross is our source of goodness and mercy. Some of you are disappointed because you've been looking in the world for goodness and mercy when the world has given up on God long ago. We can still do cool things. We can still... We can still try and make a colony on Mars. doesn't mean that we've, we've got goodness and mercy. The Lord is my shepherd, my promise of abundance. The Lord is my security. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Why? Because he is with me. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And so I want to just underline an expectation for us, and uh, I'll, I'll use some signs to illustrate this. Um, Sis so Snabs, please come and be goodness. You embody that in so many ways. You must never sit near the front row on Sunday mornings. It's just, you guys never learn. You always get involved in examples. Um, Petros and Bira, come and be mercy. Deeply merciful man. <laughs> and uh, uh, Datvalile, come and be representative of any of us. And you are, you are facing this way. This is the direction of your life. In this direction, you have things that you are trusting God for. You have responsibilities. You go to work in a certain environment. You live in a certain neighborhood. You have responsibilities towards a community. I hope you don't see yourself as an individual because you cannot live as an individual in the kingdom of God. I hope you see yourself as part of a community. There's other people. There's responsibilities in front of you. If you're not a Christian, I'm not talking to you today. This is how Christians see themselves. This is how disciples of Jesus see themselves. You are trusting God for some stuff in the future, and you're trying to live in a way that actually makes sense. We're in a world that's crazy. And, and so often we are looking this direction and we're saying, God, would you just give me a sign? Would you just go ahead of me so that goodness and mercy are in front of me? And you pray that prayer and you look up again and you don't see, you don't see goodness and mercy in front of you. David says it's not that way. Goodness and mercy come behind Dadvalile. Dadvalile, stand where you are. Goodness and mercy, stand behind him and strengthen him in the presence. God, stand behind him and strengthen him. The goodness and, uh, and mercy of God have been shown to you even in the past through Jesus' resurrection, his cross and his resurrection from the dead. Now Datvalile accesses that goodness and mercy and he steps forward into a world wow. that is without goodness and mercy. 
a world in which there is struggle, a world in which there is strife, a world which is cruel, a world which the, the writer John describes in the book of Revelation as a beast that has fangs and claws, a society that is so unjust and greedy and sophisticated that it tears apart human life. And he is not afraid of it because though he walks through the darkest valley, the Lord is with him because the shepherd is in front of him. Come, Wilson, come and be in front of him. Come and be in front of him. This is the shepherd that is in front of him. You don't have goodness and mercy in front of him, but you have a shepherd in front of you. And because the shepherd is in front of you, you go forward into the struggle and goodness and mercy, catch him up. Don't leave him behind. Now take another risk. Take another risk. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Goodness and mercy are not in front of you. Stop looking in the wrong place for your hope. Goodness and mercy will follow you when you stand forward in confidence. Stop looking to the world for hope. Stop looking in the darkness for light. Stand with confidence in the kingdom of God. Goodness and mercy will surely follow you all the days of your life. And wherever you are, you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We don't need a new economy. We need a shepherd. We don't need a new political system. We need a shepherd. We don't need more money. We need to return to the shepherd of our souls. We don't need more power. We need more mercy. We don't need more anger on our, on our legs. We need to get down on our knees and ask for healing. We need a shepherd and we need his goodness and mercy. Some of you have massive disappointment issues this morning. You have massive trust issues this morning because you've been looking and saying, God, just give me a sign. Just give me a sign. Just show me that it's going to be okay. He's not going to put the goodness and mercy in front of you. The shepherd is already in front of you. He, he already. When, when David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are close behind me. I want you to understand something. Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, he was the great shepherd. And he got up on the cross and the powers of darkness that are trying to tear your life apart and trying to tear our world apart at the moment. The powers of darkness with claws and fangs that, that cause humanity to tear itself apart with evil from the inside. Jesus Christ walked into that valley. He was taken captive by those powers and dragged into the depths of hell. But you can't take the good shepherd into the depths of hell and expect that he will be overcome. He was raised from the dead and he came out of the other side of the valley and so you can walk through the valley because he's already come out the other side stop asking for a sign in the future stop asking for God to show the goodness and mercy it isn't there but Jesus has shown you already by going through the valley now take his hand and walk into the valley now get up tomorrow morning and say I am the reason that other people will have confidence and hope and goodness and mercy Goodness and mercy are coming to my school through my shepherd. Goodness and mercy are coming to my neighborhood through my shepherd. Goodness and mercy are coming through the presence of God in my life because I have a great shepherd in Jesus' name. It's time for us to get our confidence back. It's time for us to trust in a God who loves humanity so much. And, and when I say get our confidence back, it's so easy to think about being confident in who God is. The scripture teaches us to be confident in who we are because we have Christ in us. Not confidence in your personality or your good looks or your success or your money or your authentic self. That's the latest uh, postmodern idea, your authentic self. I'm just going to be my authentic self. No, no, no. Only Jesus can show you who you are. Be confident in the image of God in you. Be confident in the presence of God in you. Be confident in who Jesus has made you to be. Our world needs people who are confident. How many of you always feel confident? I don't. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I left you up on stage much longer. How many, how many of you always feel confident? You always feel confident. Do you know, I don't trust people. I don't trust this macho, this macho hyper-masculinity that walks around 
I'm sorry if you go to gym. I, I, I love you. Jesus loves you dearly. <laughs> but like, I'm just, I'm just using this as an example. You know, uh, there's some guys that I see at gym that they can't use their phone, their phone properly because their bicep is so big, so they have to put it on speakerphone. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Monday. Monday, yeah, okay. When you ask them where the bathroom is, they're like, it's over there. <laughs> Might be over there. Um, I'm playing. If you go to the gym and you want to look after your body, please do that. But we have like this, this hyper-masculinity, this hyper-strength, and, and then we bring it into our faith lives, and it's like you're always confident in Jesus. Let me tell you something. The way that you get confidence is by bringing your weakness and your anxiety and your fear to Jesus. That is, and anybody who is walking around with their chest out like this is actually just compensating for the fact that they feel really quite lost and quite small on the inside. You know what I'm talking about? Would you agree? And so don't trust people who are strong all the time. They're hiding something. I wish I had more time to download this to you. I just, I want to lead you in a prayer as we as we get to the end of the service. So let me get through some scripture. I am going to, I'm going to read you some scripture and I want to encourage you to use this app called the Pause app. Um, by the way, I'm listening to a brilliant book. I just finished it called Resilient by John Eldridge. They've also built this app called the One Minute Pause app. And on this app are basically led prayers with scripture. It's free. It's very low on data. There's about 10 prayers on there. They range from one minute to 10 minutes. And the idea is that it gives you a reminder, a notification on your phone, and you press play, and you pray in your car. Uh, it leads you through meditative prayer. This is helping me and so many people so much. And I'm going to draw on some of these thoughts in one of the prayers. And I'm actually going to read verbatim one of the prayers at the end of the service. I can't encourage you enough to go and download this. I want, you, I want you to learn that you've got to take authority with your mind. Um, listen to, here's just promises of scripture. If you want to take notes, you'll have to go and meditate on these things. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, we understand these things because we have the mind of Christ. It might be verse 17, my apologies. We have the mind of Christ. If you're a scripture reader, you'll find it one verse afterwards. You have the mind of Christ. Have you ever thought about this? That you, you are one mind with the greatest mind in the universe. If you have put your faith in Jesus. Again, this is not the postmodern religious idea that there's a God somewhere within you and if you access your inner thoughts and your true being that you'll find this glorious thing. No, no, no. Christ needs to come into our lives. We need to surrender control. He needs to take the evil out of us. He needs to forgive us our sin. He needs to put a new nature in. And then you can trust that new nature. And now you can actually trust your thoughts. Do you know, when God speaks to you, what voice does he use? Dadvalile, this is God using the God voice so that you're not confused that I am God. He uses your voice. He uses your voice. By the way, the devil also uses it. And that's why you've got to constantly be renewed by the Holy Spirit. Your flesh uses it. The devil uses your flesh against you to speak to you in your own words. So, but now you have the mind of Christ. What a thought, guys. You have the mind of Christ. Another truth. Just embed this uh, in, in you. Um, the life, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 to 6. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature are also dominated in the way that they think about sinful things. Okay, But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Do you know that every time you give your attention to Jesus Christ, the Spirit directs your thoughts towards life and to peace. You become like whatever you give your attention to. Whatever you look at, you will become like that. Some of us spend so much time looking at the front cover of a magazine that we're unhappy with ourselves. Meanwhile, it's photoshopped, airbrushed, doesn't exist. Even that person is like, wow, I wish I could look like that. Some of us spend so long scrolling the Instagram feed 
that you end up dissatisfied with your life or your business or your husband or your wife's body or whatever the case is. And, 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 and you fix whatever you fix your attention on, that's what you become like in your thought life. And your thoughts drop into, into your affections. They start to change your affections. And then it gets into your body and you start to live in the wrong direction. But every time we fix our minds on Jesus Christ, the same mind of God that is in you starts to direct your thoughts to towards God, and you experience life and peace. This is so, this is so beautiful and healing in a gentle way, because it means that in your place of anxiety and struggle, in the places where you feel weak on a daily basis, uh, every 10-minute basis, you don't need another YouTube video. You don't need another conference. You don't need a three-week holiday in Cape Town. You need three minutes to let the mind of Christ come to life in you. You just need three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes to center your affections on Jesus Christ. And the miracle of the cross works in you. The Holy Spirit starts to well up His beautiful life, His healing life. The river of living water that's inside of you starts to satisfy your soul. And your whole body, soul, and spirit are redirected in the ways of God every time you pray. Isn't that beautiful? We we, you see, we don't trust it because, because we, we just have so much else going on in our mind. Now, here's the final scripture that I'm going to read, and then we're going to pray. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension or high thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Now, I need uh, someone who has energy. Um, who am I going to pick on? I'm going to pick on Mike. Do you know what, Mike? You actually look like Jesus today, so. <laughs> it's, your, it's your just tall awesomeness. Okay. Jesus, come and stand here and just look kind and dignified. Now. I need, I need some people to be disruptive elements. Who feels like there can be a disruptive element here? Um, Ishe, I'm sorry to make you close your... Is that your new Bible? Yes. He's been wanting this Bible for a long time. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God for a young man who's saved up for a new Bible. He's been saving for that. And he's like, I want this. Is that the Joyce Meyer one? Yeah. That's the one that you wanted. Yeah. Jesus is good, right? Okay. So just pretend that you aren't who you are. You are, you are a disruptive, evil thought. A thought, a thought that's that of, of fear, okay? I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid if I, if I take this risk that God won't be with me, that my children will be hungry. I'm afraid that if I forgive that person, I'll have no power over them. I'm afraid that if I don't manipulate and have this angle in the workplace, that I'm gonna be a crush, so I better shrink back. I better not do anything with excellence. I better not put myself out there because I could get my head chopped off at any, at any moment. Um, uh, I need another disruptive personality. Ronnie, 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 Ronnie. Come on, bud. Uh, again, never be in any of my connect groups. You always just end up in, in church on a Sunday morning. Thanks, bro. And um, you're going to be, you're gonna be this, uh, this thought of rage. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm angry, and, and I want to show people because I'm, I'm deeply uh, I'm deeply wounded by something. I feel like something is drastically unfair. I feel like injustice has been done to me, and I want to prove myself. I want to defend myself. Um, here is uh, another one, self-preservation. Tubes, come and be self-preservation here. Okay. Self-preservation. You just think, you just think, if I just have enough for, for, for this week, for this day, for this hour, for me and my family, if I just play it safe, if I just do nothing wrong, then I should be all right. And what happens is that although your life is given to Jesus, have you noticed that your mind is still given to a whole lot of other things? And the battle for our souls exists in our minds, in the thoughts that we have. And you could add to this list. Now I need some people who... Just look tough and scary. Jumbe, I think it's your beard. Uh, Kudzi, come on up here. Solly, it's a beard vibe. Come on. Mar Mario, let's go. Oh, 
All right. Okay, guys, just come and stand on the stage here. Come and stand on the stage. Okay. Okay, now just pretend that none of you love Jesus. I want you to fold your arms. I want you to fold your arms. I want you to look angry and tough and just generally. Is this not an intimidating beard? Does this beard not strike fear into the heart of the enemy? See, you have other forces available to you other than the forces that are at work in, in the law of your mind, captured by the flesh. Let's put that scripture up again, my last one um, that I just read. We take captive, everybody say take captive. We take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is on the throne of your life, but you have other stuff that's going on in your mind. Now, these things are meant to distract you. They're meant to disrupt you. They're meant to disrupt the life of Jesus. So what I'm going to do, you guys, just start running around. Just be like crazy. Just, just be like crazy. Just run around here on the stage. Just be disruptive. Go free. Yes, just be disruptive. That's it. You've got disruptive thoughts in your mind. Okay. All right. Now. Now. Go and be disruptive over there. Just disrupt. Continue with your disruption. Disrupt, disrupt. Yeah, disruption. Yeah. Okay. Now, whenever there's disruption happening in your mind, you get quiet with the Holy Spirit because you have the mind of Christ. Because the same thoughts of Christ. Are, keep disrupting, guys. Because the thoughts of Christ are within you. And now, Holy Spirit, come and take captive. I want you to grab them. Take them captive. There can be a bit of a fight. Take them captive. Get it. Get fear. Get anxiety. Get them. And take them to the feet of Jesus. Take them to the feet of Jesus. Put them on their knees. Put them on their knees at the feet of Jesus. Fear, you go down. Anxiety, you go down. Depression, you go down. Disruption, you go down. Rage, you go down. Lust, you go down. Sexual confusion, you go down. No, I'm not going to have an affair. No, that, that woman is not better than my wife in Jesus' name. And you hold them down. Now, sometimes, sometimes they get up. Sometimes they get up. And, 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 and rage just gets up. And you say, let him free, let him free, let him free. Now, the others stay captive. Go, go free, go free. Okay, now take him captive again. You took him captive this morning. And put him back down. Put him back down. And hold him there. We take captive every thought, every 10 seconds of our thought life. And we make those thoughts obedient to Jesus Christ and to the person that he has made us to be. Every 10 seconds, every three minutes, every four days, every morning at five o'clock in the morning, you take captive every thought and you make it obedient to Jesus Christ. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Those who are with you are more than those who are against you. Fight the battle in your mind. The battle in your mind is the battle for our community. The battle in your mind is the battle for our children's future. The battle in your mind is the battle for our country. You can't take captive those forces out there. Stop ricochandering against them in your prayer meeting. Just start to take captive the thoughts of the enemy in your mind, and you will be better resourced and live in greater victory. And if you do that in community, then we're going to go after the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Stand to your feet. You guys can be seated. Thank you so much.